Okay, so it's a joint work with Hubert Lacroix from Rio. And uh, so I'm starting with uh, an auxiliary process, which is called the bias card shuffling. So I have a deck of N cards, which are labeled from 1 to N. And uh, uh, so a configuration of cards, it just um, the N cards um, in some ordered or order. So for instance, I have my N cards in front of me. Yes, so here n is equal to five. And each card has a label, so for instance, this. Okay. And I can encode, of course, uh, such a configuration of cards with a permutation um, of one n. And here, uh, sigma, so sigma i is basically the label of the highest card, so for instance here, sigma one is three, sigma two is one, sigma five is two. Okay. And now, the dynamics is the following, so I have um, a, a stochastic dynamics, so I'm given some p in one half one, and I let q be the complement of p, and I do the following, so in continuous time, uh, for each, for every pair of adjacent cards, I do basically two things. So at rate P, I place the two cards Um, in the increasing order of their, of their labels. And at rate Q, I place the two cards in the decreasing order of the labels. Okay? So for instance here, I start from this configuration at M0, and at rate, so here for these two adjacent cards, um, at rate P, I will swap the two cards, and at rate Q, I do nothing. While uh, for those two cards, at rate P, nothing happens, but at rate Q, I swap the two cards. <coughs> okay, so I have an evolving configuration sigma T. It's a mark of process, and let me denote by Xi the initial condition. Okay, the initial configuration. Okay, so the process is irreducible, and it's a simple fact uh, to check. So simple fact, you can check that the unique invariant measure, invariant probability measure, which is actually reversible, actually the process is reversible with, with respect to this measure, uh, is given by mu n of sigma, so you have, you have a partition function Zn, and you have the ratio of p over q to the d of sigma, and this d of sigma is just the number of transitions which are needed to go um, from sigma to the identity. So identity means the permutation where the labels are in the increasing order. Okay. So actually it's, it's simple to check this because um, to check this you just need to check that the detailed balance condition is satisfied, okay? And basically what happens, well, for every two adjacent configurations, uh, you go from one to the other at rate P, and from the other to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the first one at rate Q. So, and then 
for any, any transition, either you go one step uh, away from the identity or you go uh, closer to the identity. So this number increases or decreases by one. So it's, it's, it's pretty simple to check this. And actually this quantity is also uh, given by the, this number. Okay, but it's, it's not important for the talk. This is what it's called injection. Okay, um, so now the question is, the question we were interested in with Hubert was uh, the time, how much time is necessary to, to reach equilibrium uh, starting from the worst, <coughs> from the worst initial condition. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Um, so I need to quantify, to, to give a precise notion of distance to equilibrium. So here, um, so here the distance to equilibrium will be given by the total variation distance. Okay, so I recall that when you have uh, two measures, the total variation distance is the maximum of all measurable sets of p pi of a minus nu of a, and it's also equal to the infimum of all couplings um, of all couplings of pi and nu. The infimum of all couplings p of pi and nu um, and of the probability under p that x is different from y. Okay. And now I define the distance at time t of my chain from equilibrium. So I look at the low at time t starting from some initial condition xi. So qt of xi is the low of sigma t psi. And I look at the distance with what I called mu n in total variation distance. And I said, I want to understand what happens when I start from the worst initial condition and, and therefore I, took, I take the, the maximum of all initial conditions. Okay. Um, and then to quantify the convergence, I need the notion of mixing times. Okay, so I'm, uh, uh, yeah, so something, this is always in zero one, of course. And mixing times, well, you consider some threshold epsilon, and you define Tn of epsilon as the first time at which this distance goes below epsilon. <coughs> yeah. So now, what should be the typical dist uh, picture of uh, dnt as a function of time. Well, so it initially it should be close to one. And then what we expect, and what is actually true um, asymptotically, is that this distance should decay exponentially fast with time. And the rate of exponential decay should be the spectral gap uh, of the generator. Okay, the check. But now, there are cases where you have sequences of Markov, ch of Markov chains where the asymptotic behavior of this sequence of distant, distant functions uh, is not at all like this. And you have cases where when you, you take a sequences of Markov chains where the distance behaves like this, so it stays close to one for a long time and then suddenly drops to zero at some deterministic time. Okay, so, and this time is deterministic but could go to infinity with n. And this is called a cutoff phenomenon. Okay. 
so in terms of mixing times, here on my first picture, my mixing times um, were basically all different. Okay, so you had a smooth decay of the distance. When you have a cutoff phenomenon, basically all the mixing times concentrate at uh, are equivalent at first order. Okay, so cutoff phenomenon, mathematically it means for all epsilon, Tn of epsilon is equivalent to, say, Tn of one half. Okay, they are all equivalent when n goes to infinity. Okay. Um, no. Uh, okay, so maybe I should give some examples of sequences of Markov chains for which you have uh, a cutoff phenomenon. Okay, so examples. So first, uh, take the simple random walk on the lattice, on the segment. So you take n sites. Okay, and you take a random walk in continuous time. Okay, so it's basically a particle that jumps at rate one half to the right and one, right, one half to the left. Okay, in that case, the invariant measure that I call mu n in that case would be the uniform measure on the segment. And in that case, if you draw the, the picture of DNT actually, Asymptotically in N, you won't, you won't see a cutoff phenomenon. You will see something that decays smoothly with time, but at the scale N squared. Okay, so in the diffusing, diffusive scale, this sequence basically converges to a Brian motion on the segment, and you have a decay given by the, uh, by the spectral gap of the, of, the, of the Laplacian. So you don't have cutoff here. Now, if you consider the asymmetric, or even the yeah, asymmetric uh, simple random walk, uh, so same picture, segment, but now the walk goes to the right at rate p and to the left at rate q, and you take uh, p larger than q. In that case, um, the invariant measure mu n is not uniform at all. It's actually something which is very much concentrated to the right, and it's actually a geometric uh, law um, from site n, which is basically um, so the restriction of the geometric law on one n, basically. And now, what is the worst initial condition in that setting? Clearly, it's when you start from site one. And what should be the, 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 the mixing time? How much time would you need to reach equilibrium? Well, in that case, if you start from this site, since the invariant measure is very much concentrated here, the, the mixing time is the time that you need, the ballistic time that you need to go from site one to essentially site n. Okay, and this, and this, um, and this time is very much concentrated and you will see something uh, which uh, falls abrupt abruptly from one to zero at time n over p minus q. Okay, n over p minus q is the ballistic time that you need to uh, cross the segment. So, so, so here you have a cutoff phenomenon. Okay, because basically if you are before that time, your particle will be far from the support of the invariant measure, basically. Okay. Um, okay. So now, what is what is the result that we have with uh, Uber on this uh, on this on this bias card shuffling? So for all epsilon, so for all, all p in one half one, and for all epsilon. Uh, we show that T, Tn epsilon divided by n is equivalent when n goes to infinity to 2 divided by p minus q. 
Okay, so we show that all the mixing times for the bias card shuffling are equivalent to this uh, quantity. So we have a cutoff phenomenon. Uh, maybe a few remarks. Um, so actually there was a work by Benjamini and co-authors uh, in 2005 where they showed something like Tn epsilon is uh, bounded by some constant time n, but they didn't have the precise constant. And uh, there was a work of Uber in the symmetric case, so p is equal to q is equal to one half. And in that case, he showed that Tn epsilon again has a cutoff phenomenon. Um, but this time, the, the mixing time is not of order n, it's of order n square log n with a constant which is something like one over two pi square or something. Okay. Um, Okay, so for the moment, there is no clear connection with uh, conservation laws or PDEs, but uh, now it comes. Um, okay, so there is a natural projection to consider. So projection of the bias card shuffling. Um, and so this projection consists in looking, so you, you take k, some k in one n, you fix k, and you consider only the cards, the positions of the cards whose labels are high, okay? The k highest cards in your pack, okay? So you define eta t as um, those cards whose labels are either n minus k plus one, n minus k plus two, up to n. Okay, so basically I place ones, okay, I place one on those, on the positions of, of those cards whose labels are, are large, and zeros on the positions of cards whose labels are small. Okay, so, so I'm in this state, state space and I have uh, k, exactly k ones. Okay, now, so I have a projection of a Markov chain, okay, in general it's not, not Markov, but in, in this particular case, um, so uh, this is a simple fact, eta t is actually an asymmetric simple exclusion process. Okay, so it's actually. Sorry? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so K would be the number of, of uh, number of, of particles, the total number of particles. Okay. They are indis 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 indistinguishable. Um, so, okay, so let me recall the, the dynamics of this, of this process. So we have the segment, okay, one n, and you place uh, some particles, k particles on this segment. And what is the dynamics of the simple exclusion process? So we saw this morning, each particle um, goes to the right at rate p, and to the left at, at rate Q, except when you have a particle on the target site, and in that case, you just erase uh, the jump. Okay. And now I have boundary conditions, and the boundary condition, basically, you just uh, erase any such uh, jump that would make uh, the particle leave the lattice. Okay, so the dynamics uh, of the simple exclusion process is the following. And actually, it's simple to check that what I defined there 
indeed has this dynamics. Okay, because basically, if you have um, a card which is adjacent to a, a card with the high label, for, so for instance, here suppose uh, this uh, is a card with a label which is above n minus k plus one, then it is swapped with the adjacent card if the, the labels are increasing at rate q. Okay. And uh, conversely, here you have a card with a higher label than here, and you swap the cards at rate p. Okay. And then uh, if you have two adjacent cards with high labels, you can swap them uh, or not. It doesn't change the, I mean, it has no effect in my state space. Okay, so. Yeah, so. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, now if you want to compare the... Then you divide into kind of yeah. those that are class less than k and those that are yeah. class like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you look at the coupling for different k's, then... Uh, yeah. Would it be equivalent to this thing called uh, uh, maybe Ferrari and uh, other people when they construct the Napio, if they construct it in very major, you have more class particles. Okay. Okay, may, okay. I, I don't. You mean the whole projection? Yeah. Yeah. And also here. yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying it's new. The projection stuff. No, no, no. I mean, kind of. This is equivalent. I think you're basically creating some kind of uh, uh, state for gas or water and all that happening at the moment. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, so now, uh, one can study this model in in its own right, and actually, it's. It's convenient to look at an equivalent representation of the particle system. So given a particle system, it's, it's convenient to look at what, what is called the height function. Okay, so it's a lattice path that starts at zero and makes plus one or minus one steps according to the presence or absence of a particle. Okay, so for instance, here I have no particle. I encode uh, my height function by, with a minus one. Again, a minus one, then a plus one because I have a particle. Again, a particle, minus one. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, let me add a particle, uh, just a side, sorry. Um, right. Okay. Okay, so I have a correspondence between configurations of particles and height functions. And now my set of height functions uh, is basically a rectangle. Okay, so all my height functions live in this rectangle. Um, and the dynamics that I have here can be translated in terms of height functions. So if you look at the dynamics here, it consists in flipping corners. So I flip downwards corners upwards at rate uh, Q, and I flip um, upwards corners downwards at rate P, okay? And so basically by my asymmetry P larger than Q, I have a tendency to go downwards, um, okay? And again, I can, I can look at the invariant measure for uh, the ASAP, which is also reversible, and it's given by, so I call it mu, so mu and k. Um, so for some, okay, so I can, I can define the, the measure at the level of the particle system or at the level of the height function, so we can consider the height function, and it's given by a partition function, that nk, times the ratio of p over q, divided by minus one half of the area under H, and the area is just uh, the area uh, below my height function here, in between my height function and the lowest height function. And again, you can check this is true because when you flip a corner, the area will increase or decrease by two, and this happens with rate P and Q, so the detail balance condition can be, can be, can be changed. And the same, I can, I can ask for, I can define D and K of T 
as um, the maximum of, of all initial condition of the total variation distance between um, P, T, and K of Xi. I don't know how it's called. Um, yeah, okay. P, T, Xi. And my invariant measure in total variation distance. I can, I can ask the same question uh, than for the um, bioscar shuffling, and the theorem is the following. So what we got with Hubert. So for all p in one half one, for all alpha, I will say what alpha is afterwards, and uh, for all epsilon, the, the mixing time, so t, n, k, epsilon divided by n, yeah, so t and k of epsilon is the first time at which this distance is below epsilon. And this quantity converges when n goes to infinity to square root of alpha, the square root of one minus alpha squared divided by p minus q. <coughs> so what is alpha? So actually, I didn't say what happens for the number of particles, okay? And here, I'm imposing that there is a density of particle, k over n, that goes to alpha when n goes to infinity. Okay, so I need to look at a consistent uh, collection of processes, and the consistency goes through the number of particles. Uh, so I'm imposing a limiting density for the, but the limiting density can be null. Okay. And the connection with PDE will uh, uh, come next. Um, so, maybe a few remarks. Um, so, there, there is a work by Levin and Perez in uh, 2016 where they showed that T and K of epsilon is in between two constants, K1N and K2N but they didn't get the same constant. So they didn't have a cutoff phenomenon, but what people call a pre-cutoff phenomenon. So it's a sort of concentration, but not complete somehow. Um, then there was a, a work by Hubert for the, um, for, the a, for the symmetric case, where he showed a cutoff phenomenon. Um, at speed, so the mixing time was of order n square log k. Okay, so basically n square log n, if you like, except for boundary, uh, boundary cases. Okay, I'm not too, I don't want to say too much about the condition on k, but basically, uh, you also got a cutoff phenomenon in the symmetric case. Um, yeah, and maybe another, another remark about this. So another remark. Um, so you can see there is clearly a symmetry, several symmetries in the system. So basically, if you, you have a symmetry P1 minus P. So basically, if you reverse the drift of the particles, um, well, the cutoff phenomenon will be exactly the same. The mixing times will be exactly the same. Instead of going to the, le to the right, they will go to the left. But now there is also a symmetry between alpha and one minus alpha, the density of particles. Because you can also view the particles are empty sites. Okay, and now the empty sites, they go to the left. And due to the symmetry, you transfer the, the result for the complement density through this symmetry. Okay? Um, fine. Uh, so now, what about the proof? Uh, so I will concentrate on the exclusion process, and then, by an argument that I will not present, you can transfer the results from the exclusion process to the uh, bias card shuffling. One thing is, if you look at the larger, largest mixing times, 
the largest, largest mixing times over alpha, it's reached for alpha is equal to one half. And for alpha is equal to one, ha one half, you get two here, which is the constant which is above there. Okay. Um, Okay, so what about the proof? So I will concentrate on this, uh, on the ASAP. So ideas of the proof um, for the ASAP. So first, the first step consists in obtaining the hydrodynamic limit. Um, Okay, and, and then it's related to what uh, Christophe uh, uh, presented this morning. So we look at, so basically it's clear that the worst initial condition in this setting, since the measure is very much concentrated on the smallest uh, height functions, okay, you have, you have a term here that uh, favors height functions which are very, very low. The, the worst initial condition is the highest height function. Okay, so the worst initial condition um, should be the highest height function. Height function. Uh, so, so then we can look at the evolving height function and in an appropriate uh, time space scaling, so I'm speeding up time by n over p minus q, and I'm looking at the height function, I'm sending the, the lattice one at zero n onto, onto zero one. Okay, so I'm looking at rescaled quantities. The lattice zero n is on zero one, and I'm speeding up uh, time by n over p minus q. And the maximal height is for the n, so it's natural to take one over n for the, for the scaling. And then the proposition is that uh, Hn converges in probability to a deterministic process H, which is given by the solution of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. With Dirichlet boundary conditions. which is two alpha minus one. Okay, what is this? This is just, so the value of the height function at this point doesn't depend on the height function. Okay, so in the scaling limit, the value of the height function is just deterministic, I mean, it's constant, independent of t. Okay, so, so this is nothing but, if I take the derivative of this, I get, the inviscid Berger's equation. Um, and actually the proof consists in looking at the derivative at the density of particle. Okay, which is basically the derivative of the height function and in proving that rho n converges to the solution rho of um, basically the derivative of this uh, equation. So we recover what Christophe showed this morning. But this time it's with um, zero flux boundary conditions. Okay, because the system at the level of the particles uh, is endowed with zero flux boundary conditions. Okay, I can't, I can't exit the lattice. So it's natural to have um, zero flux boundary conditions. And so the solution of this type of PD, I think it's due to um, Burger, Fried, and Carlson. I think. 
Um, so now technically for the, for the, for the convergence, it's, it's basic, the, the, one, one tool um, is that actually this solution coincides with the appropriate Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, sorry, so the appropriate Burgers equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions. So actually fact, this coincides with the same equation, but with uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. Um, so you impose a boundary con condition zero to the left and one to the right. And of course, you understand this in the BLN sense. Um, and the, the coincidence is quite, I mean, it's quite intuitive because you can view the whole system, the whole particle system as living with, uh, on the whole lattice with only particles after n and no particles before zero. Okay, and this kind of emulates those boundary conditions. But of course, the system inside uh, does not necessarily satisfy the same boundary conditions. Or you can also take uh, reservoirs at the boundary, and at n you have a reservoir with um, density one, and due to the asymmetry, nothing happens. And at zero, you have a re reservoir with density zero. And then you recover uh, this kind of thing. And so now the convergence for the original boundary conditions, it's basically due to uh, Bahadurand um, in 2012, I think. And it's also related, of course, to uh, the initial work of Reza Kanlu in 91. Fine. Uh, so now, given this hydrodynamic limit, what do we deduce about the mixing times? Um, so, I can draw explicitly the solution. So solution H, starting from the worst, what I expect to be the worst initial condition. Okay, so I rescaled things on zero one. Uh, here I have alpha, here I have um, alpha minus one. Okay. And so I start my equation from the worst, what I expect to be the worst initial condition. And I look at the solution of this PDE, and it's explicit. So at time zero, it's here, and at some small time t, it's still stuck to the maximal height function, but then it follows some par parabola up to the other boundary, to the other um, boundary. And then at a later time, I will see something like this. Again, a later time, I will have something like this. And then finally, it will reach the lowest uh, configuration and the heating time of the lowest configuration is square root of alpha plus square root of one minus alpha squared. Okay, so the time that you need for this PDE to go from the highest height function to the lowest one is, will in the end be the mixing time. Um, and again, it's due to the fact that the measure, the invariant measure is very much concentrated on uh, small configurations, which in the scaling limit are all concentrated on this single path. Okay, and from this, uh, hydrodynamic limits, uh, we deduce the lower bound uh, for this uh, result for the, for the mixing times. Okay, so from this, we deduce the lower bound on TNK epsilon. Okay, you need at least this amount of time to be at equilibrium because right before you would be at around some configuration which in the, at the microscopic scale would be very far from equilibrium. So you need, you need at least this amount of time uh, to be at equilibrium. Now, 
One could think that you, this is actually also a proof for the, the upper bound. Okay, one could think that this is enough to deduce that this is exa exactly the mixing time. But actually, in such, if you have such a configuration, such, such a macroscopic state, um, you have not much information mic microscopically. Okay, so if you look at this height function, for instance, so I'm coming back to the microscopic um, uh, configurations. I can consider this height function that makes one step, one, uh, step to the uh, above and then only downwards steps and then come back to um, 2k minus n. Okay, so this configuration, for instance, in the scaling limits, when n goes to infinity, converges to this lowest uh, macroscopic state. But this configuration is extremely far from equilibrium because it has one particle which is far to the left. Okay, so you can't, out of this convergence, you can't exclude that at this time, your height function is actually in such a configuration which is completely atypical for the dynamics, for the invariant measure. Okay, so then we need some work to exclude this, and that's the second step. That's the second step. We look at the um, leftmost particle at time t and at the rightmost empty site. Okay, that's the information that is missing basically in this picture. That's one of the information which is missing. So I'm looking at the position of the first <laughs> particle uh, coming from the left. So basically, if I look at my height function, I can guess uh, where this leftmost particle is. Okay, if I look at this, well, at time zero, I, would ex I, ex I know that the first particle is here. Okay, so I would tend to define L alpha of zero to be zero. Then at this time, it's still at this point. But then at the time where the, the height function is in this configuration, I expect the first particle to be here. And so it's natural to define at that time L alpha of t as this uh, quantity. And then at a later time, I would expect the first particle to be here. And finally, at the mixing, at what I expect to be the mixing time, I would expect L alpha of capital T to be here. But of course, the hydrodynamic limit doesn't give this information. And so what we prove, we prove that indeed, for all T, um, L and K of T rescaled, sped up appropriately, converges in probability to L alpha of T. Which means that indeed, microscopically, the, the particles follow the hydrodynamic limits. And so to conclude the argument, um, once you have this information, um, Once you have this information, um, the third step consists in um, basically contracting in a small time uh, what is left. So what I mean by this is if I look at the particle system at time, um, at what I expect to be the mixing times, so I look at my system at this time, what should I have microscopically at the system at this time it should be um, <coughs> it should be uh, n k minus n. At this time, I know that the leftmost particle is close to uh, this quantity. So, in the worst case, I'm at a distance epsilon, say, for any epsilon. Uh, from the equilibrium state. So in the worst case, my height function starts going up um, 
at a position which is at distance epsilon n from the, the bottom of my height function. Okay? So it means that at that time, with large probability, my system should live in this small box, okay, of size epsilon n in basically both directions. Okay, with large probability, given this result, I know that my system lives in such a box and I need to contract, to have a final argument to contract the system. And here is the, so let me explain how we do this. So we use a spectral decomposition, not a complete spectral in, uh, decomposition, but a partial spectral decomposition of the generator. So we prove by some sort of discrete Hopf-Cole transform, which is due originally to Gartner, which is used ex extensively in KPZ, we prove that actually the spectral gap of the process, so minus the first non-zero eigenvalue, is given by um, something explicit. Something like this. And this is of order one. Something like this. And we also prove that the first eigenfunction, the corresponding eigenfunction, is actually monotone in H. Okay, so it's ex explicit actually F1, I could write it, but it's not necessary to have the expression. But F1 is monotone in the sense that if you have two height functions which are ordered, F1 preserves the ordering. Okay? And now, how to use the spectral information to complete the argument? Um, well, it's um, not too hard. So what we know, we know that since this is a, uh, an eigenfunction of my generator, I know that F1 of HT times E to the uh, gap NT, this is a martingale. Okay, this is a martingale. So now I want to compute, I, I want a, an upper bound on my distance to equilibrium and actually uh, D and K of T, so my distance to equilibrium. Um, it's a simple fact that this is always bounded by the maximum of all pairs of configurations of the distance between the chain starting from Xi and the chain starting from Xi prime. It's a simple calculation that I don't repeat. Just believe me. Um, and so now, this, if we recall the definition of total variation distance, is the infimum of all coupling, so I can consider one coupling. And I look at my height function. Um, I look at the coupling of the two height functions and I consider the, the probability that they differ. And now let's consider a coupling which is monotone, that is, that it's, that it's pre, it preserves the ordering. Well, if the coupling preserves the ordering, this maximum is reached, it's even equal, to the probability that, I, that the highest height function is above the lowest one. Okay, because if I take a coupling that preserves the ordering, the maximum here is reached when I take the two extremal uh, height functions. Okay, and this by my uh, monotonicity of F1, it's equal to the probability that F1 of HT starting from the highest height function is above H1 of HT starting from the smallest height function. And now, so this is equal to the probability that the difference is strictly positive. And actually, I can also replace strictly positive by strictly above delta, 
where delta will be, would be the smallest increment of F1. The minimum of F1 of H minus F1 of H prime. And this is computable because F1 is explicit. And I, now I can use the Markov, uh, Markov inequality and I get the expectation of the difference And by the Martingale property, I get e to the gap nt times um, f1 of the initial condition minus f1 of the other initial condition divided by delta. F1 is explicit, everything is computable, and out of this computation, I can deduce an upper bound on my mixing time. So actually, this upper bound is not sharp. You don't get the right constant, but you get the right order. You deduce that you need something of order n to, to compress the, the system. Now you use this type of argument, but now locally. So you use this argument at the level of this small box. n become, becomes epsilon n. So I have a prefactor epsilon in my, I mean in my upper bound. And since epsilon is as small as I want, we deduce that you need something arbitrarily small to be, to be compressed, okay? Starting from this time, okay? You need an additional time of order epsilon n, and epsilon is as small as you like, okay? um, And uh, yeah, so just a last remark. Um, this doesn't depend on k, the spectral gap. So that's the same spectral gap, whatever k is. Um, and another remark is that this proof works for the, not only for the asymmetric uh, simple exclusion process, but also for some weakly asymmetric simple exclusion processes. You can have a, weekly, a weak asymmetry, but not too weak. Um, and this can be also, uh, the, the, the cutoff phenomenon can be proved as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs>